。はい。Okay, Paul, unmute. And share screen. All right, hopefully, we have Bill in front of you. Yes, yes. we do. Good. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, friends, family, and、uh, extenders of a fellowship in its fourth year. I'm just so pleased to be able to greet you all and welcome you on this Christmas season and anticipate that we can share together in fellowship, learn some things, discuss and enjoy each other's company on our two dimensional format. And this evening, it's our pleasure to have William Shepard, who is a regular participant and presenter. He is the author of many of the Restoration History articles.、Uh, he asked me to read a, a portion of one of them for me today, and, and he's written so many that I had a hard time finding it. <laughs> Two of them that were closely、uh, associated, and so、uh, fortunately we were able to find it. So、uh, I think that will work out nicely this evening.、Uh, this evening he'll be addressing us on the mortal enemies that、uh, were encountered, particularly in Nauvoo, but.、Uh, Fundamentally, in the Mormon Wars. And Brother Shepherd is a leader of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints, the Strangite movement in Wisconsin. And he is uh, uh, particularly notable for his teaching of developmentally disabled children. And that has given him special insight into William Hodges, the case of the two Hodges brothers that were executed in Burlington in uh, uh, 1845. For the murder of the Mennonite gentleman who may well have been murdered by somebody else after all. He regularly participates in our forum and we welcome him for his presentation because、uh, he is one who embodies the passion of the restored gospel, calling us to speak truth to power. And so I welcome you all and ask for you to join me in prayer. In this Christmas season, kind Heavenly Parent, We recognize the call for peace in a world where so often peace is not apparent. Wars in Ukraine, Gaza, Myanmar, and Sudan are killing three or more people every day, and we find many more than that being killed in the US of A. So we see the legacy we have inherited is one in which our wars only temporarily cease. And we call the time of tension between a blessing, and we call it peace. Yet, because the world in which we live promotes the tyrant, the exploiter, domination, empire builder, the wealthy tycoon of power, it is difficult for us to appreciate a culture of peace, any peace enduring beyond an hour. And this evening, we look at mortal enemies, the theme to be presented by Brother Shepherd. Historically tied to us and our regrettable past, a pattern in the Book of Mormon and our own restored gospel record. And we need to learn to be people of peace, to learn to live in immortality. For you have promised that to be with you in well reasoned love. Beyond time and space can be our eventuality. So we bow before you, Prince of Peace, Lord of Laughter, Laborer in Love, to ask your blessing on our speaker and on our participants, a blessing to be bestowed from angels here and from above, and as well upon our earth with its history so apparent. Needing transformation to be a world, a people at peace, in harmony with the will of our heavenly parent, in whose name we pray. Amen. Brother Shepherd, the floor is yours.
Bill, you need to unmute, please. Sorry. Uh, written Fine. two articles about the violence at Nauvoo in the John Whitmer, the one in the fall, one or two or one three, titled Martial and Discipline for War, a documentary con chronology of conflict in Hancock County, Illinois, 1839 to 45. And the other in the uh, spring, summer 2016, uh, with a friend named Michael Marquardt about Mormons and Missourians, the fact that they didn't seem to be able to let go of one another after the Mormons uh, leave, uh, uh, leave Missouri for Illinois. I've called on some help, though, uh, uh, if Robert Cook is going to help me, so would you do that, Robert? Would you put the first item up, please? And Robert is muted. Notice that this is early. This is from the LDS History of the Church in uh, in July on July seventh, eighteen thirty three, uh, in the first volume. But I found it interesting because it's a manifesto of the mob. Uh, uh, they've won. They've they won it. It uh, driven the Mormons out of of independence, of course, and. And they they write here, it has been more than two years since the first of these fanatics or knaves, for one or the other they undoubtedly are, made their first appearance among us and pretended as they did and now do to hold personal communication and converse face to face with the Most High God to receive communications and revelations direct from heaven to heal the sick by the laying on of hands, and in short, to perform all the wonder-working miracles wrought by the inspired apostles and prophets of old. Their manifesto, if you look it up, it, it's, it's considerably longer than this, but it's worth looking up in the LDS history Volume 1, roughly page 375. And what struck me is the vehemence of the non-Mormons, the way that they literally thought of the Mormons as if they are totally contemptible. So again, I struck by the feeling that this at least just gave to me that this is truly the way they felt about the Mormons. So if we'll go to the second one, Robert, please. Uh, for, for, this is from uh, a great historian named Richard L uh, Bushman. Uh, and he, and he, uh, he says, uh, similar predictions were often heard among the saints. McCory estimated that the Mormons had declared, quote, perhaps hundreds of times that this country was theirs. The Almighty had given it to them and that they would surely have entire possession of it in a few years, unquote. This is, this is non-Mormon speaking. We are daily told the, the, the settlers complain that we, the Gentiles, of this country are to be cut off and that our lands appropriated to them for inheritances. The Mormons declare openly in that manifesto that I referred to, uh, that they're quoting, said that, quote, their God has given them this country of land and that sooner or later and will have possession of our lands and our inheritance. So cultures in conflict, if you will, the Mormons and the Missourians. Uh, 
try the next one, please, Robert. The actual basis of this, this is still Lyman Bushman talking. The actual basis of the settlers' fear was neither Negroes nor Mormon violence, but the Mormons' growing political influence. Since the arrival of the first band of saints, steady influx had swelled Mormon numbers to, to 1,200, one-third of the county's population, and the end was not in sight. Reading the Millennial Star, the citizens knew the church was actively proselyting through the north and east, recruiting more and more migrants to Missouri. In a few years, they would control schools, governments, and courts. So what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to use this premises that, that these three quotes and go to Nauvoo. And, and I will ask you if you think that, that this is simply transposed from independence to Nauvoo, or how much of it is transposed? In essence, how much trouble did the Mormons bring upon themselves? So, as we go to Nauvoo, you can take that down, please. As, as we go to Nauvoo, we're going to talk about violence. And we all know, of course, that the prophet and patriarch are murdered. We know that, that other Mormons lose their lives, that this violence, but it went both ways that we're going to kind of cover tonight and hopefully strike a balance between. And I've asked Paul if he would just would just read a page that I had put in an article about violence or about what we're going to look at tonight. My apologies, Bill. I think your uh, screen is on top of mine so that I can't uh, find it to read it. Um, oh. so I'm trying to pull it up on another on my other computer here, and I haven't gotten there quite yet, so you're ahead of me. Okay. Uh, Give me just a moment. I, I think uh, I think I should have it here shortly. Okay. <clears throat> but I'm going through some of the same problems that I went through this afternoon, trying to get myself logged into JPass. I, I have a problem as 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 being uh, Robert Bruce Landers, as some of you knew him, is in a session he did one time. And he was talking about when he wrote the autobiography, the biography of Joseph Smith. And he said, I felt guilty for some of the things that I said about. And he, he felt very bad for the problems that it caused others that faithfully believed that Joseph Smith was a prophet without faults. Uh, in the Strangite tradition, uh, it's generally held that Joseph Smith was perfect, or by some of the people at least, that all the problems were the fault of the non-Mormons. So I guess I'll be relating to that in this topic, maybe trying to do soothe my guilt. I'm sorry, I have not been able to come up with it yet, uh, Bill. I, I will continue searching. The question is, what is my password? Well, why don't, why don't, if it's okay, Paul, I'll go ahead and read it. Uh, because I think it it is significant. I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay, and, th and thank you. Aspects of frontier violence described in this article would be considered outrageous if they occurred in modern society. Mormons and anti-Mormons in Illinois lived in a dramatically different society in which the Jacksonian philosophy of individual rights 
predisposed individuals to settle disputes by force when the legal system could not or would not bring satisfaction. For example, Judge Thomas Ford had firsthand experience with criminals at vigilantism in Ogle County before he became governor of Illinois. Illinois, or Ogle was victimized by a ruthless criminal gang headed by Josh Driscoll that specializes in stealing horses and even murder. Following the burning of the new Ogden jail by members of Driscoll's gang in March 41, Ford, who was unable to legitimately bring the gang to justice, was accused of advocating the, the formation of vigilante group designed as, designated as regulators. The vigilantes captured several gang members and severely flogged them. But the criminals retaliated by murdering a regulator named Campbell in June 1841. Driscoll and his son were captured and following a trial by the regulators were executed by firing squad. So it was a different place and a different time with different values. And I wanted to read one, one item just to punctuate that. And this is uh, 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 Joseph Smith talking uh, let's see. He has an altercation. This is from the LDS history of the church. He has an altercation with a Mr. Bagby, a tax collector. And he says, Mr. Bagby, the collector, came up in the midst of our conversation and when asked about it, denied all knowledge of it. I told him that I'd always been ready to pay all my taxes when I was called upon and so forth. And he, said, and he says, Bagby called me a liar and picked up a stone to throw at me, which so enraged me that I followed him a few steps and struck him two or three times. Esquire Daniel H. Wells stepped between us and succeeded in separating us. I told the Esquire to assess the fine for the assault, and I was willing to pay it. He not doing it, I rode down to Alderman Whitney, stated the circumstances, and he imposed the fine which I paid. And then I returned to the political meeting. So once again, you we're talking about a difficult almost desperate times because the Mormons had been well seasoned in violence, meaning they had been on the receiving end a number of times. Obviously, Hansville massacre and other things driven from Jackson County, the other counties, uh, now they're in Nauvoo and they are wanting to stay. So what I thought I would do is uh, is go over some some quotes from this book that I hope will elicit conversation and uh, uh, just about this whole Mormon thing. Uh, were they always in the right? <laughs> The Mormons, according to Robert Flanders, quote, swept in on this frontier backlog, backwater like a tidal wave, unquote, and editorialized, Hancock County has not been the same since. So this, this idea uh Of, of uh, I was looking for something else here. Uh, 
have the country of violence and starting chronologically, I guess. And I started with October 29th, 1839, kind of at the end of the Missouri period, the beginning of the Nauvoo period. Joseph Smith began October 29, 1839, Joseph Smith began his journey to Washington to present hundreds of Mormon affidavits, affidavits to federal officials to obtain redress for Mormon losses suffered in Missouri. And we all know that President Martin Van Buren told, I can't help you because if I did, I would lose the Missouri vote or words similar to that. Now, kind of switching gears a little, I wanted to talk about some of the violence that occurred it, in the Nauvoo area. On July 7th, 1840, Mormons Anselin Brown, James Allred, Benjamin Boyce, and Noah Rogers were kidnapped from an area below Warsaw for alleged stealing and removed to Tully, Clark County, Missouri. Four Mormons are kidnapped and taken to Missouri at, in uh, July 7th, 1840. And this created a big ruckus because the Mormons went to their governor who approached the Missouri governor and back and forth and back and forth uh, these four Mormons were restored, but they were badly, savagely beaten over in Missouri. Looking for another, going up to November 2, 1840. And I, I felt it was important in this, in this to, to include include a little about Mormon politics. Remember, the Mormons are basically Democrats, aren't they? But in November 2, 1840, the Mormons rejected Democratic President Martin Van Buren, with good reason, and voted for Whig William H. Harrison for president. Social historian Annette P. Hampshire explained, the Mormon bloc voting left some area Gentiles, quote, with a sense of outraged powerlessness. So along with the violence and the other aspects, uh, the Mormon vote is very, very important in this article. In June 4th, 1841, Joseph Smith made a courtesy call on Governor Thomas Carlin at his home at Quincy, but was unaware. Now, what had happened was the governor of Missouri had submitted writs for the arrest of Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon and others because he said they escaped. Now, the now, I think the Missourians would have been glad to let the issue die with the Mormons. They had had enough. But when Joseph Smith went to Washington and calls on all the congressmen and stuff complaining about the Missourians, I suspect there's some getting even uh, by... by uh, uh, the Missouri governor, uh, I'll just read this, uh, uh, but was unaware Carlin had received the demand from Governor Thomas Reynolds of Missouri that he was a fugitive from justice. After he was arrested by a posse dispatched by Carlin the following day at Bear Creek, Smith prevented his extradition to Missouri by obtaining a writ of habeas corpus 
uh, for Calvin Warren, the master in chancery for the Adams County Circuit Court. A trial was scheduled. And, and if you could imagine what luck or fate said that this is being presided over by Stephen A. Douglas. And Douglas was uh, a political animal. I don't think he was uh, against uh, going after Mormon votes. Douglas is going to rule that the writ that was used to arrest uh, Joseph Smith uh, essentially ruled the Missouri writ had expired and was therefore illegal. A historian John Dinger editorialized, quote, the trial is very important in the development of the habeas corpus in Nauvoo, even though it did not involve a Nauvoo-based writ. It showed that the law, that the Mormons, that they had a powerful legal device at their disposal. And the use of this habeas corpus is going to become a major dev divisive in uh, enmity between the Mormons and the non-Mormons. Jumping forth, just to show again the Missouri business, May 6, 1842, Lilburn Boggs, ex-governor of Missouri, who gave the extermination order, remember, in Missouri, Lilburn Boggs was shot at Independence, Missouri, and not expected to live. Now, most certainly, the person who shot him was Joseph Smith's bodyguard, Orrin Porter Rockwell. The person that shot him shot through a window with a big horse pistol and four, ball, four balls entered Boggs's body, three in his head, and it's a miracle that he lived. Rockwell is captured and put in jail, and he's going to spend a year basically in solitary confinement without even charges brought up against him. And Joseph is going to, for a year, get a high-powered lawyer to get him released. But this is just another cog in, in, in the game, if you will, between the Mormons and the Missouri. Uh, now, jumping back to the writ of habeas corpus, the, the city council passes this. It says, no, no citizen of this city should be taken out of the city by any writs without the privilege of investigation by the Mormon the municipal court. So they are protecting people from coming in and grabbing particularly Joseph Smith and other Mormons. In July 22, 1842, Governor Reynolds forwarded Boggs' affidavit because Boggs has appeals to the Illinois Governor Reynolds to, to, to bring back Joseph Smith, extradite him. Uh, uh, Joseph Smith is listed not only a fugitive, a fugitive of justice, which he was before, but after the attack on Governor Bog, he is now uh, an, an accessory before the fact to an assault with intent to kill made by one O.P. Rockwell on Lobernberg W. Boggs. Mormon Missouri relations couldn't be worse. August 6, 1842. Another figure pops in that's very important 
His name is Thomas Sharp. He's the editor of the Warsaw Siddle, the Signal, and he hates the Mormons. And he is is going to dog them and be a part of the reason that Joseph Smith is is murdered, ultimately. But he, but it's it's interesting is what he says. Uh, uh, based on on an election that Joseph Smith was not uh, against using his political clout, and in the in the election, uh, uh, the Mormon vote goes against Thomas Sharp's person. But the important thing here uh, is uh, uh, let's see if I can find it. He says, the old citizens of Hancock County are now the subject of His Royal Highness Joseph Smith. We are now totally deprived of one of our dearest rights of free men the elective process. So things are getting worse and worse and worse. Brother Shepard, if I may intrude, uh, if I recall correctly, Thomas Sharp lost that election to William Smith, Joseph's brother. That was the election to the, uh, to the Congress of, of uh, Illinois. And that is true. Uh, it, it's it's truly if cultures cultures in conflict uh governor ford uh, obviously the new governor of illinois that we all know about for on those reasons honored governor Rennell of missouri's request to extradite joseph smith and issued an arrest warrant. So Joseph Smith is, is going to be at Nauvoo, and he's going to be staying from place to place to place, and he's going to be evading the law, if you will. This is going to go on for a very extended time. But again, this is uh, the Mormons and the Missourians. Joseph Smith, it's rather interesting, in June 23rd, 1843, uh, Sheriff uh, Joseph H. Riddles of Jackson County, Missouri, and Constable Harmon T. Wilson of Carthage, Illinois, arrest Joseph Smith at Dixon, Illinois, where they're visiting Emma's in-laws. And, and this, this is really, really looks could have been very bad from the Mormon side. But uh, the following day, Smith managed to obtain a writ of habeas corpus from a, lo a local master in chancery, which prevented his being taken uh, to Missouri. Prominent Whig lawyer, Cyrus Walker, Remember, he's been tied up with the Democrats before, but Cyrus Walker is right there. Uh, prominent uh, Whig lawyer Cyrus Walker, who was in the area electioneering to become representative for Congress, agreed to defend Smith after he was promised his vote. So the long and the short of it, Joseph Smith isn't extradited to Missouri, but you have the the Whigs in the picture now, and both the Whigs and the Democrats want the Mormon vote. Going up, uh, oh, uh, Shepard, may I add to that one? Because from Dixon, the Nauvoo militia came to uh, help escort Joseph Smith and the arresting officers back to the mansion house in Nauvoo, where Joseph Smith then hosted the arresting officers for dinner. 
Yes. Let me let me just read this paragraph here. Smith went. Uh, Mormons sent to intercept Smith became increasingly desperate after they could not loc him, locate him and feared he was in danger of being reviewed, removed to Missouri. One party led by Wilson Law approached the village of Okwaka on the Missouri River in Henderson County and charged full speed into the community with drawn swords and cocked pistols except Smith was not there, but it shows the desperation of the Mormons because uh, Wilson Law says if they, boys ride hard, because if they take Joseph to Missouri, they will kill him. And then he said, then we'll lose our property values too. So uh, that's a very real sentiment. Uh, the Mormons do make contact. And of course, uh, they celebrate, uh, but they go back uh, and pass another uh, ordinance. Re the ordinance requires visitors, quote, to give their names, former resident, and for what intent they have for entering or tearing in the city of Nauvoo, and answer such other questions as the officers shall deem proper or necessary. And just kind of jumping, jumping forward, I don't want to talk too long. I want to hear your comments. August 1, 1843. Uh, and this is, this is really my favorite, I guess. Uh, an argument took place between Joseph Smith and Walter Bagby, a Hancock County tax collector at Nauvoo over the sale of one of Smith's flocks. The history of the church says, Bagby called Smith a liar and picked up a rock to throw at him. Smith became so enraged, he struck him badly two or three times. So then he went and sought the alderman and paid a fine. But, uh, and Bagby's going to, have a, a good part in in uh, in Joseph's death. In December 2, 1843, uh, Mormons Daniel Avery and his son Philander from the Bear Creek area were kidnapped by a group of Missourians from Clark County and Levi Williams and others from Green Plains and Adams County. Uh, Daniel and Philander were forcibly taken to Clark County, Missouri, where Philander managed to escape, but his father received brutal treatment. He finally is released on a writ of habeas corpus uh, later that month. So, response. The Avery kidnapping spurred the Nauvoo City Council to pass their most severe ordinance titled, quote, Special Ordinance in the Prophet's Case versus Missouri, unquote. The ordinance authorized payment of persons, the ordinance authorized punishment of persons found guilty by the city council of attempting to arrest Joseph Smith. Now this is true, quote, to imprison it in the city prison for life. And by this reveal it, it, a few months later, but you see the passion that the Mormons have in their desperation to keep their profit out of the hands of the Missourians. And I, I cite something from March of 44, and it, it shows the, it, the extent that the bad press that the Mormons have received, probably nationwide, but surely regional press, that the Mormons are on the receiving end of the bad publicity. I gotta have a drink. Mormon William Adams remembered arriving at Nauvoo and taking the Mormon steamer, 
the maid of Iowa to Nauvoo, he said anti-Mormons screamed obscenities from them when they landed for supplies. Others attempted to burn the vessel and some shot at them. Much of this, of course, is, comes from the uh, Missouri period. Uh, 101. Uh, I'm kind of winding down to the end of this. Uh, uh, we know that we're getting to the end of Joseph Smith's period. Uh, in uh, June 12, 1844, a warrant was issued by Justice of the Peace Thomas Morrison for the arrest of Joseph Smith and others involved in the destruction of the Nauvoo Expositor. Smith was arrested by Constable David Bettingsworth at Nauvoo, uh, but following an appeal to the Nauvoo Municipal Court on the writ of habeas corpus, he was released, but we realize that his time, he is going to be arrested and and the worst is is going to happen. Uh, so I would really, if you have any interest in this period, in the in the latter years, I guess, of Joseph Smith, but particularly the hatred that Missouri had for the Mormons. And this hatred is reciprocated. It's, it's truly an unfortunate part of our history. I was in Missouri when I was a young boy a little bit, and you could still hear uh, people talking bad about the Mormons. So I think that uh, covers, thank, thank you. Well, thank you, Brother Shepard. Uh, I, I, I find myself intrigued because in my own study, it, it, uh, it appears to me that cultures in conflict is really a very good uh, framing for understanding because with the Missouri Compromise, Missouri came into the Union as a slave state. Maine came in as a free state. Mormons, well, that would have been 1820. Mormons in 1831 go to independence in a slave state and attempt to establish Zion where uh, all people are equal and that includes the blacks and includes the the uh, savage Indians. And in Missouri, the law had been written that anybody that was black was a slave unless they carried their emancipation proclamation or their papers of emancipation. And so it was really a very harsh day there and the Missourians were anxious to to rid the state of the uh, First Nation people. And we can see that at the same time that the Hans Mill incident was taking place in 1838, the Potawatomi were being marched across the state at a loss of about 100 people just marching across the state of Missouri. And if you walk, if you take the Highway 24 route, you can see the markers uh, to some of those people that were that were killed or that died in that uh, in that forced march. So yes, there was a good deal of harshness. I find it interesting to to see the statement from uh, Senator Atchison, who was the gentleman from Missouri who claimed to have been the president of the United States just for one day. The Senator Atchison is noted for commenting at the end of the Mormon War, so this would be 1839 or 40, that uh, now the now it was. I'll see how did he say. Now it was time to Mormonize the abolitionists. The Mormons had been exterminated, and so he wanted now for us to, to Mormonize the abolitionists. The Mormons had brought a bunch of Canadians in and others 
from the Northeast that were also abolitionists. And so to Mormonize those, according to Senator Atchison, was the appropriate course of action. And he made uh, a political career out of that. And so I, I find it fascinating to see how strongly the conflict between cultures here played out. And yes, I agree that the writ of habeas corpus proved to be a major downfall because Joseph Smith used it to his own advantage and to the advantage of his people. And so the people of Illinois saw that as discriminatory and uh, and haughty. Thomas Sharp clearly was able to magnify that, uh, that sense. And so, yes, we did end up with a very sad outcome. And so, Brother Shepard, here we are with all this history, and yet here we are in the Christmas season. How do we learn peace? I don't. Know. I I found in in my research that things wouldn't have been so bad with the Mormons if they would have been a third as big, because once you come into a community or an area and you secure the vote as i read in there that is truly the main area uh, of discontent that was bigger than stealing that was bigger than than violence it was but numbers interesting well then why did that not happen when uh, Joseph Smith III had them settle in Lamoni? I, I I think it's as you know I'm a fan of of, of Joseph the uh, Third. I think it was his his sweet disposition and and what he exuded. He was not a threat. Uh, Times were changed too. This later on, and the hostilities are a lot gone. But again, if he would have been coming in saber rattling, it would have been a different story. And let me also ask about the uh, Zion's camp activity. Uh, to what extent do you think that was a stimulus? You mean the 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 effects of Zion's camp? Right. Having two hundred and fifty Mormons marching across Missouri, presumably to help reclaim their lands in Jackson County, clearly could not have been seen by the Missourians very favorably. Well, certainly not. Uh, uh, and and it's a miracle that there wasn't a lot of bloodshed during that that march. All I'd right. like other other people to answer that. Yeah, let's let's give let's open the forum. Terry's got his hand up, and let's remind people go to the to the uh, what's that reactions down there and raise your hand, and Deb will keep people in order. Okay, Terry, go ahead. Okay, uh, the first thing uh, I put this in chat, but I'll talk about it now. That he mentioned that Tully affair right at the beginning, where there were four. Uh, Church members were hauled back into Missouri. James Allred is my four great grandfather. Okay, he was the he was the oldest man in that group. He was, he was old. 60s. He was very old. Yes, he was in his sixties, and they tied yes. him up to a tree, and yeah. wouldn't feed him and whatnot. And he came close to dying. And somebody came from Nauvoo and and pleaded with them to let this old man go, and and he got out. Uh, there's a there's a, a a master's degree at BYU that talks about this. Uh, the second thing is that I think it's the political influence that got him in trouble in Missouri and in in Nauvoo. Um, the the polygamy was a, a minor issue, and so was some of the other things a minor issue. But it was the political influence that everybody feared, including the governor of Illinois, 
uh, Thomas Sharp beat the heck out of that deal. Uh, and it's just, they just did <laughs> not want a huge voting block in one area. And so that was the biggest issue to get rid of him out of the state, both states. It's interesting. <clears throat> Once they got to Utah, they were, they didn't have anybody that could kick him out. So they, <laughs> so, so they stayed there and grew, but uh, it, it happened in Kirtland. It happened in Missouri. It happened in Illinois, that the political influence was a huge issue. I, I totally agree. I'd like to hear other comment on that. John Mueller, go ahead. Well, in Illinois, Nauvoo was the largest city in the whole state. And it was understandably feared because they had their own militia, they had their own governor, they had their own printing press, they had already uh, wiped out another printing outfit that was anti-Mormon, you know. They were not exactly easygoing. I agree totally with what you're saying uh, uh i kind of wonder what i would do if in my little community that i live in if if a bunch of jehovah witnesses came and and took over i find it interesting also that joseph smith approached or had the yeah made the approach to the u.s congress to make him the general, over a hundred thousand man army to uh, protect the settlers from the from the invasions in the West. Um, that's rather an audacious kind of thing for him to have done, but given the fact that the Nauvoo Legion was as big and powerful as it was, and given the fact that Nauvoo was in a peninsula that reached out into Iowa, so that it was almost out of the state. And, uh, well, Iowa Territory was out of the state, and the Missouri River was part of, of the boundary waters that were supposed to be patrolled by the federal government. And yet here, Joseph Smith and his militia were, were patrolling it. Uh, then, yeah, there's just an awful lot of interesting political tension there and, and conflict. Let, let me read what I, I did. It says the Mormons, according to Robert Flanders, I, I, I assume, you know, he was a great RLDS historian, uh, swept in on this quiet frontier backwater like a tidal wave. And that's, he couldn't have said that any better. But he goes on. One respected Mormon historian said, Nauvoo, quote, grew from 100 in 1839 to about 4,000 in 1842, rose to about 12,000 in 1844, and stood about 11,000 in 1845. And as the gentleman said, largest community, if you will, in Illinois, probably bigger than Chicago. Okay. We've got uh, James Lucas and then Val. Go ahead, please, James. Well, um, actually, if you carry the history forward, um, there are some interesting lessons to be drawn. Because even after uh, the, uh, you know, Brigham Young group went to Utah, uh, these uh, political divisions still remained very strong in Utah because when they, uh, once the, some non-Mormons started to move to Utah, uh, again, the political parties uh, uh, split on um, religious lines and the uh, uh, the Mormons had a political party called the People's Party. And um, what was the non-Mormon party? I think it was called the Liberal Party. Uh, in the old 19th century sense of liberal, like the liberals in England. I think that's what they call their party. And that continued to be uh, a source of uh, 
intense uh, uh, division in Utah up and uh, and through the times of the uh, federal government persecution of the Mormons and so forth. And it really only ended in the 1890s when the LDS church made a deliberate decision to close down the Mormon political party, which was called the People's Party, and ask um, all the Mormons to uh, uh, to, to uh, distribute themselves between the Democrats and the Republicans. And um, uh, my understanding of the history is that the Republicans uh, at the time, having been more active in anti-Mormon activities, uh, that most of the Mormons tended to be uh, inclined toward be uh, affiliating with the National Democratic Party. And so much to the uh, that uh, church leaders actually, uh, you know, uh, actively signed some uh, Latter-day Saints to become Republicans so that there would be an, sort of an even distribution between the national political parties. Of course, in the subsequent uh, century, that uh, allocation has now gotten switched around. But um, at least those are the, the sort of the traditional political stories about the history of Utah. And the lesson, to answer Paul's point, is that at least, again, this is um, just looking at it kind of from a practical historical point of view, what was actually done, what actually worked, rather than a kind of idealistic point of view uh, about how you get peace. And it would appear, at least as far as uh, uh, the, the Latter-day Saint faith community is concerned, uh, is that um, the uh, solution seems to be some sort of political neutrality. And uh, at least the uh, Latter-day Saint Church in Utah, or the, you know, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, really is, uh, goes out of its way to declare and actively pursue a very political neutral position, uh, so much to the extent that at least uh, some Latter-day Saints are a little bit irritated by it in that this causes the church to uh, uh, hold back on taking uh, some political positions that uh, might be morally justified uh, th because of the intense desire based on this now, you know, very long history of uh, the church constantly getting in trouble when it meddled with politics. <laughs> you know, meddling with politics spe has spelled nothing but trouble for Mormons for 200 years. <laughs> And at least that would seem to be the practical historical lesson, you know, again, setting aside ideal uh, solutions like, you know, to try to help us all get along just as a practical solution. We need to uh, just uh, uh, apparently as of right now, the solution appears to be just try to uh, have at least the institutional church not involved in uh, politics and political issues. So anyway, those are kind of be my observations of uh, what the actual history is. Steve Pineker just put the uh, picture of Mitt Romney up. I think he may be doing that as a as a counterpoint. Uh, what's your intent there, Steve? <laughs> I just had to throw this out there. It's really interesting because, you know, B.H. Roberts was a Democrat and he was kind of discouraged from being active. And then Joseph Merrill was kind of in the same situation running as office for a Democrat when the, the, the Mormon church decided they wanted to kind of side with the Republicans, which is kind of an interesting history. And of course, I had McCain and Coppins come on my program to talk about Mitt Romney and his candidacy for president and also his Senate career. It's a really fascinating story about, you know, and I asked, I asked McKay, I asked him this question. I said, did you talk to Mitt? Because he did 45 separate interviews with Mitt Romney. So did you ever ask Mitt Romney about Joseph Smith's campaign for president? He's like, no, I never had that conversation. I'm like, oh, how do you not have that conversation with him, right? So it's just kind of interesting. I I, I I popped on here and I know Val, your hands are up and I love you, Val. I think you're a cool guy. Um, I just wanted, I came here because like, I wanted to wish everybody a Merry Christmas because I really appreciate the Book of Mormon Perspectives Forum. And, uh, but yeah, it's really fascinating to uh, study the political history of the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints vis-a-vis -vis its relationship What's so ironic is that the Republican Party was founded to combat the two uh, relics of barbarism, uh, polygamy and slavery, 
And yet now it's become one of the most Republican states in the nation. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Steve, and welcome back. Welcome and Merry Christmas to you as well. Good to, good to have you again, my friend. Okay, Val, go ahead, please. Yes, uh, just, just following up on what Jim said, I think uh, probably the church's political neutrality more recently has served it pretty well in that it, it seems to me that uh, Christianity's kind of taken it on the chin because it uh, evangelicals became aligned pretty strongly with republicanism and and even with Trump. And I think it's been damaging Christianity in the nation somewhat that that uh, that connection. And so the LDS Church, I mean, even when uh, President Nelson came out in favor of the uh, vaccines, and that alienated people because it became a political perceived at least as a political issue. But I, that wasn't what I wanted to uh, comment on. The comment I was going to make is, um, I think probably the effort that the saints made in Illinois to have political power was a natural reaction to what they'd experienced in Missouri, where the state power uh, turned on them. And it, it backfired on them ultimately, but Initially, they had a lot of uh, that political power and the Nauvoo Legion and all that it was an understandable outgrowth of their experience in Missouri. Um, at least that's my conjecture. But the question I wanted to pose for Bill is, because uh, I'm not a historian, so I don't know, I, I mean, I know something about that period, but uh, I'm. do you think that... Um, uh, I, it seems to me that the restoration could not have happened earlier in history than it did because some degree of commitment to religious liberty was necessary for the restoration to happen. But uh, as you said, Jacksonian um, America was a pretty... Um, bellicose place in a lot of ways and and it seems to me that uh, that what happened what the lord did is restored the church at the earliest possible moment but at a moment so early that joseph smith lost his life over it that if if it had been um like 70 years later he probably wouldn't have been martyred because religious liberty would have been more entrenched, the courts would have been more entrenched, that that kind of uh, mob action would have been less likely. Uh, so what do, you, what do you think about the timing of the restoration and the conditions that made it possible? Uh, was, did the Lord in effect sacrifice Joseph for the sake of getting the restoration on earth as soon as possible? I don't know. Uh, the great, great question, and it's kind of scary, too. Uh, you think, what what would have happened if it was in the years of Teddy Roosevelt? Was the, 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 it would have been a different affect. Uh, you, you know, that you would think and the exuberation, but once you I think start threatening other other religions, if you will. Uh, I I don't know. And what great question! I I'd love to hear other of your responses. It's the chicken's way out. <laughs> Okay, nobody's going to respond. Uh, Rainbow Eagle, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Hello to everybody. Oh my. Um, I do think that uh, conditions warrant certain things to happen as well as not to happen. 
and feel like uh, there's uh, a timing involved whenever there is some kind of uh, desire for something uh, to, to take place. Uh, so I give that comment uh, to uh, the season that was probably ripe for uh, 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 things that we see in the last 50 years take place. The second thing, not sure I have the words for it, but <laughs> yes, uh, talking about the violence, the attitudes uh, of uh, the um, Missourians and uh, toward the Mormons, there has to be uh, some kind of uh, an attitude by the Mormons uh, of uh, being uh, God's people <laughs> and that God gave uh, that uh, chosen people the right to uh, uh, kind of lift themselves up as uh, special in the sight of God. Uh, that, that kind of demeanor is picked up really easy uh, by people who are not Mormons. So I can kind of see, of course, uh, it was a man's void, vote. And uh, we're assuming that the whole group of Mormons are going to vote the same way. Uh, that's a, a little difficult for us to do, uh, uh, to honor democracy, if, if that's kind of it. But I really think there was this uh, attitude that just really lit the fire on the part of the Missourians, as well as uh, the neighbors, uh, whenever there was the uh, Mormons coming into uh, the area. Uh, so I think uh, there, it, it, we're seeing the same thing take place in the Bible lands, the Holy Lands, right, of an attitude of being chosen and somehow having God's uh, uh, favor. Uh, those are really uh, flaming issues. And as a native person, I can kind of see how uh, that attitude was uh, uh, something that was hard to understand. Certainly there would be tribalism that had a feeling like they were uh, better than somebody else. But when you have numbers of people holding that kind of energy, I can see, boy, that response is immediately, uh, let's, uh, <laughs> let's get them out of our territory here. And, and the land ownership, you know, that, that sense of pride of uh, the land that you're walking on is really our land that God gave to us. And see, those attitudes would be picked up and just lit those fires all over the place. So uh, that's kind of my take on, uh, on why there would be such an attitude uh, uh, toward uh, the Mormons especially an attitude that they're all going to vote the same way. Where's our democracy in that, see? Uh, but that was the condition of a group had a single consciousness and they're going to have a single vote. And also they, have, they really have an attitude <laughs> that just repulses me. That's uh, so I can kind of put myself there and say, whoa, hey, what attitudes uh, where's their spirituality <laughs> you know they're they're presenting themselves as a, as a people that are uh, more important than others let, let me just add right quick that the, the they pick up we're democrats no we're whigs no we're democrats again and so no one trusted them essentially after that. It's still a group consciousness. It's still a group. Where's the individual? Of course, it was the men's vote. The, the women didn't get a chance to vote uh, at that time. Uh, but uh, what if you decided that uh, you liked somebody that the group didn't like, uh, you know, as a Mormon? Boy, it seems like the individual vote got lost in this, this group consciousness. Rainbow Eagle, thank you for coming. We are smarter because you're here. Thank you for sharing your perspective with us. I, I really do appreciate uh, what you've added. I would add a comment to that, however, uh, because the slave owners of Missouri had the constitutional right to property. 
And the Mormons were effectively defying that by telling them that black people shouldn't be property. And so here was another of those significant political issues. And when you have someone like uh, Sidney Rigdon on his July 4th sermon issuing the point that uh, the Mormons may have to exterminate those that are hostile to them, then here's another of those stimuli that uh, ends up breeding contempt and and warfare and ultimately the Governor Boggs extermination order. And so I, I find that that just, uh, yeah, you're right. There, this, this conflict of, of cultures is so significant as people build up large numbers of, of people. I, I look at the, uh, what was it, 30 years ago or so, 40 years ago, the Boonies came into large concentration in, I believe it was Oregon. And uh, they ended up with significant conflict because they were taking over the politics of an area and that became objectionable to the, to the local native people. So that's that's a repeating theme. Yeah, I, but I wanted to thank you for participating with us again because, as usual, your comments uh, add a dimension that I think we really need. James, go ahead. Yeah, just uh, 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 Bill makes an excellent uh, point when he notes that uh, one of the exacerbating factors in Illinois was that this uh, Joseph kept jumping back and forth between the Whigs and the Democrats and kind of alienated both of them. So to kind of carry forward my comments I was making before, um, if you just kind of look back now, of course, alternate history is enormous fun and also very dangerous because who really can ever, can ever say what would happen if important historical factors had been different. Uh, but uh, in Missouri, I rather suspect that there was nothing to be done because the northern the saints who were largely northerners were walking into the middle of a uh, conflict that you know, went far beyond, you know, Protestants versus Mormons. It was, you know, they're walking into the middle of a of a conflict that was going to tear the nation apart within 10 years of, uh, or 10, 20 years, I guess, of that time period. But it already was starting to tear the nation apart. So one could say that maybe, now it would have helped if they had been less imperialistic in their own rhetoric, if the Latter-day Saints had been less imperialistic in their own rhetoric, but still there were issues that went beyond Missourians and Mormons uh, at play in Missouri. But in Illinois, which is a free state technically, um, and which was initially rather welcoming to the Latter-day Saints, um, you know, it's a question of alternate history, uh, but interesting to wonder about if Joseph had been a little more cautious and a little savvier politically, and if he had not uh, tried to play politics, and if they had taken the position that Joseph F. Smith took in Utah 40 years later and said, you know, Latter-day Saints, you have, uh, you know, we're not going to try to do any group voting, uh, you know, be a Whig, be a Democrat, however you uh, think is the best party. Um, one wonders if that might have, uh, uh, you know, avoided uh, the uh, unfortunate result they had in uh, alienated the, the uh, people of Illinois, a free state that had initially welcomed them. But of course, you know, we can we can we can never tell. That's that's alternate history. But at least that's something that I often have speculated about: is uh, what would have happened if Joseph had been a little more cautious and a little, little savvier politically and and not uh, try to play uh, politics so much but anyway well that's an that's a that's an issue we'll never ultimately know the answer to so th those are my thoughts thanks Val, go ahead please i was just going to uh, sort of follow up on what i was talking about earlier with the the experience they had in missouri was that the state power was turned against them. So th this block voting thing that they did 
at least from their point of view initially, looked like it was extraordinarily successful because that Nauvoo charter that they got, the Nauvoo Legion they got, their own courts, like uh, Bill's uh, presentation talking about the um, people coming and trying to drag Joseph away, the fact that they had a, a political unit with special um, special authorities. Uh, uh, Nauvoo had re really pretty extraordinary powers that they negotiated because they were doing the block voting and because they were the balance of power in the state, the, the, legislate, the legislature initially really cooperated with them and, and gave them that extraordinary power. So from their point of view, it looked like, at, at least for the several years, that they'd achieved a, a great success with their block voting, which was designed to protect them from what had happened in Missouri. But, you know, these politics is really complicated. And over time, they, they just looked like an unreliable ally to both sides. And so the dynamics that uh, Jim just mentioned and, and that uh, Rainbow Eagle mentioned uh, kind of kicked in on them. But, at but if you if you put yourself in their shoes coming out of Missouri, you can understand why they would want something like that Nauvoo Charter and that kind of uh, autonomy, the political autonomy that they achieved, which was pretty extraordinary for the time. That, that was my comment. Okay, thanks, Val. Paul, go ahead, please. I appreciate those comments. Uh, notice that that the Mormons going to independence were going to the edge of the nation. And in Nauvoo, they again parked on the edge of the nation. So interesting that then the Mormons, they went to Salt Lake City, went to establish a Deseret to, to differentiate themselves, isolate themselves. I'm curious, and then going back to James's observation, and this is a bit uh, speculative, but he pointed out that um, Martin Van Buren did not get the Mormon vote. William Henry Harrison did. This fascinating discovery this summer of the William Henry Henderson, Harrison medallion at the Times and Seasons of, uh, of Nauvoo in 1840 makes me wonder what would have been the difference if Hen William Henry Harrison had survived with his more favorable relationship with the Mormons. I'll stop there. <laughs> okay, thanks, Paul. Rainbow Eagle, go ahead. Okay. Why in the world did Joseph Smith bring himself into wanting to bring more people into uh, his uh, his influence? It's uh, I think the phrase it may not fit, but uh, I think he kind of shot himself in his in his foot because. Uh, it's one thing to be, you know, you know spiritually uh, a leader, but it's quite another thing to really want to get into politics. Uh, yes, the, being able to see that potential was certainly there, but there's something about uh, Joseph Smith's character that really bothers me because he really stepped into other arenas that uh, um, was a result of ambition rather than leadership. Let, let me add to that. The, the famous picture of Joseph and Hiram standing in their general's uniform holding the sword, that's, that really bothers me personally. Okay, Terry, go ahead, please. Well, I think that the reason that Nauvoo grew so fast is uh, Joseph's concept of Zion. Uh, and he wanted to bring all the new church members from basically England, who about a third or a fourth of the population in Nauvoo by the time they left was British. Uh, it was a huge number. Um, and so, you know, those people joined the church. They themselves wanted to be with other church members. And that's one of the reasons they, they left united kingdom and, and came west uh and so you know those things grew but 
I, I agree a lot with what Rainbow Eagle said earlier about the the uh, people's choice. But I think in a way, Brigham Young was more politically dominant than Joseph ever was. Um, the, the biggest battle that they had once they moved to Utah was the federal government. Before they'd been fighting states, now all of a sudden they're fighting the federal government. Uh, and and his reaction to that was the uh, the the block voting that, that people didn't like and and on and on and and so he was very political in in contrast to Joseph. It'd be interesting if somebody did a study and just listed the things that you know each one did. And I think you'll find that Brigham was was a lot more political to combat the federal government. Joseph wanted the federal government's participation to help the battle the states. So it was a different fight, but you know, the the result was was similar in a way. But that's that's the way politics works sometimes. That's interesting, particularly because Joseph had sent people to Texas to see about the possibility of creating a Mormon buffer zone between Texas and Mexico, and you know when you start considering the ramifications of of uh, these political strategies that Joseph Lett and the and the big military, uh, hundred thousand men army, these are kind of proposals. Oh, and basically asking to to separate Nauvoo from the state of, of Illinois so that it could be separate uh, entity. I, you know, there's so many elements that are what you're saying. I I, I find it interesting that here's uh, uh, Bernheis Bernheis hi Bernheisel who was friends with both Joseph and Brigham, and he got to be the ambassador from, from Brigham to, to go back to Washington and try to negotiate the uh, best he could for the, for the Mormons. But here he had been a major proponent for, uh, for Lyman White to go to, to Texas and possibly a larger group of the church. So here, you, yeah, I agree. The Bernard Eisdell story is an interesting commentary and adjunct to to what you're saying. Okay, Terry, go ahead. You're muted. There we go. Texas was its own country at the time. For a few years, they were their own country. And so that was that was a way for Joseph to escape the United States government. Uh, and uh, you know, he he tried a lot of things to to help the church. You know, because they'd been beat up by states, uh, and so when they finally got to Utah, it was Spain. It was only the next year that it became part of the United States. So initially, they were trespassing into the the country of Spain uh, when they first hit the valley, and so you know, <laughs> it's it's trying to escape to get to separate countries is. Was it was a common experience for both Joseph and Brigham? That's right. <laughs> uh, Mexico, not Spain. Utah was in Spain. Uh, Mexico come, become independent. Just a detail. Yes, it was right. Okay, Val, go ahead, please. Yeah, I think the the reason the saints all stuck together the way they did that that was really a, a predictable outcome their solidarity it's kind of like i don't know if you know what was going on in israel just before the attack from hamas but israel was as divided as it had ever been in its history they had people on the streets demonstrating they had uh, military people said they weren't going to serve uh, that were in the reserve said we're not going to serve this government as soon as they were attacked that country just came together instantly politically and in, in a lot of other ways. And so the saints uh, coming together and acting as a corporate body in this, in the, as they faced the opposition they did, it was a very natural response. That doesn't make it necessarily, in hindsight, the wisest response. Although, as I said, if you read the stuff that was happening when they, when they first got there, the Nauvoo Charter and what they accomplished politically initially was, was uh, for the time, a, an astonishing success. But, I, I mean, I, I'm not really disagreeing with... We, we From hindsight, we can see 
what happened as a consequence of their solidarity. But their solidarity was also sociologically completely predictable uh, after the tax they got in in uh, Missouri. And it was also predictable when they got out to Utah that they hung together having experienced what they did in, uh, in Illinois and in Missouri. That, uh, that they became uh, kind of the people's party and everything that they did politically. And it, the thing that really got them out of that ultimately was they were trying to get into national politics and the dissolution of the People's Party, I think, pretty much had to happen as a condition for them to even become a state, which is what they were trying to do. That was their objective, and they needed to enter into uh, national politics and not have this separate uh, Mormon politics that they'd had. So, uh, again, the solidarity carried over from the from the Missouri time into the Illinois time into the Utah time, at least for that branch. And it's it's just the kind of thing that happens when people are persecuted. They cling together because that's where they see safety. Not to say it's wise or uh, long-term successful, but it was very predictable. That was my comment. I think you're quite correct. At the same time, I I look at, uh, again, I, John Bernheisel is one of my favorite people. And uh, when he was in Congress advocating for uh, statehood for Utah, as I understand it, one of the things that he asked for Brigham Young to do was to, to uh, not have slaves in Utah. But then when the census was conducted, they found... Here, Utah had 70 slaves or more. And so that issue of uh, the solidarity of the Mormons, so that those that did have slaves were able to keep them and uh, and still be Mormons. Uh, interesting how our solidarities will sometimes overlap our, our other interests. <laughs> As the same is true in politics generally. But uh, it's fascinating to me to see that, that uh, today, here we are with um, severely divided political interests, and yet sometimes those overlap to the point that uh, it's well, we get the various issues in conflict, and while people will, will become single issue voters, uh, you start looking at other issues that they're single issue voters on, and then they come together in a given party. Ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate the uh, conversation. Bill, I think you should have a chance to give us a summation statement. And I'm well, not. It's been, it's, and, it's been, excuse me. I think James is the only one that really uh, came back on my question about how do we, what do we learn about peace from all this? And the idea that we need to learn to be less politically adamant, I think that's a, a sound approach, but. I'm not sure that that's realistic. It seems to me that we probably, Zion has to have uh, people able to advocate their various positions. Don't they? Don't we have to gain unity out of diversity? Wow. Yeah, just uh, yeah make, that's, that's, that's the problem. <laughs> that's the challenge. Yes, it is. And yet, here we are doing it uh, tonight. I appreciate that here's our diversity and yet I think we have some fundamental commonalities that give us a unity that to me is beautiful. And I thank you all for sharing amicably. I I have both of these on. I can send you a copy email, either one or both. Well, I have them on email. I just couldn't find it expeditiously. I, for some reason, have misplaced my password for JPass. <laughs> Other comments, questions? Well, then we're past 930, and that's uh, a good time to sign out. Good night, the Lord is watching o'er you. Good night, his blessings go before you. Good night, and we'll be praying for you. So good night, may God bless you and give you a very Merry Christmas.